So, um, thank you all for, for having me here, for participating. Um, we get we get requests to go to a lot of hackathons from the news. Um, is this you guys can hear me now. Is that right? Um, so we get asked to go to a lot of a lot of hackathons, um, and we rarely accept because there are just so many of them, and it's so difficult to find the time. They're usually on the weekends, and, um, and so we actually stopped. Interaxon stopped really going to and actively participating in hackathons a couple of years ago. Uh, but when Hector said, hey, uh, listen, there's one in Hamilton, I said, well, obviously. We don't even go to the ones in Toronto, but we'll come to Hamilton. Uh, of course. And, and even we've got some, some people here from, uh, from Interaxon and from Neurotech UT and from Neurotech Montreal uh, who have come all the way to Hamilton because uh, this should be the capital of neurotechnology. Uh, so it's, it's a real pleasure to be in. Is that, is that going to echo? That's going to echo. Do I need to talk into the mic? Ideally. Like, Ideally. Can you, will it pick me up if, I'm over, if the mic is over here? If you project your voice, it should yeah. be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, the talk, what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is where I think neurotechnology is going uh, and what the opportunities are and why this is a great time to be going to hackathons in neurotech. Uh, so, this is a video from, uh, it doesn't have any sound, but this is from EPFL. This guy's Greg Ward 14. Uh, these guys have been working for about a decade on uh, neural implants, neurotechnology based implants uh, to receive afferent input from the afferent input from the, I guess afferent input from the spinal cord and then cross a lesion to help mammals to walk again. So regenerate the ability to walk with neurotech. This is like not the same thing as the uh, as uh, olfactory and sheathing cells or stem cells. This is, we're going to take an electrode, we're going to stick it in, we're going to interpret the information coming through down the spinal cord that is no longer re being received by muscles or the lower limbs, and we're going to try and cross that bridge for people who are fully paralyzed from the waist down. Now, this is sort of the holy grail. We've been trying to do this, we've been trying to do this for decades. Uh, this has been a, sort of a, like a, a wish for a very, very long time in neurotechnology and to be able to restore mobility uh, after a serious spinal cord injury. And two weeks ago, this was a cover of Nature, published in Nature, they had two big articles, one in Nature Neuroscience, one in Nature. Uh, the one in Nature was the fact that they had managed to do this, and the one in Nature Neuroscience was, here is how we did this, and here's how you have to encode the stimulation. Uh, so there's a whole parameter space that everybody had to search through. It took all the work of all kinds of people all over the world to figure out how this was gonna work, and then Cortine's lab, um, finally, based on all the inputs of everybody else, uh, figured out how to make this work. So now people who have, have were completely paralyzed from the waist down, three of them have walked again. These people had not walked for like four years, were totally lost control of their lower limbs, and can now walk even outside. So they had people, after about three or four weeks of stimulation uh, and training, walking like half a kilometer uh, down the, you know, like a long Lake Geneva. Um, this is probably one of the most impressive and exciting things that's happened in neurotech, and for that matter in science. Uh, in the last five years, and uh, you know, this I think is the beginning of, of like an what's going to be an industry. And this is just one of the things that happens in neurotech. So you have to you, know, you have these. This is this is an implanted stimulator and a signal processor, and it connects through electrodes to the spinal cord, and it helps people to walk again. So this is what training looks like. And then this is when they get them outside. This is walking along Lake Geneva. So these people had like not walked. This guy had not walked in four years. And the, the implanted stimulator now is walking again. And this is, there's, there's still a long way to go, but, but this is very, very exciting. So, so neurotech is, is cool for more than just this reason. Uh, now I'm going to put this in center mode and start through a little presentation. So the, the title of my talk today is, or the topic is uh, Neurotech and Brain Health. There are a number of applications of neurotechnology. We'll cover a little bit on what those are. Um, but the bit, one that I think is probably the, maybe the biggest and maybe the most important is how this can help, uh, help people live healthier lives. So there's, there are all kinds of opportunities in, in uh, active brain computer interface for device control, for uh, you know, 
video games or typing with your mind, uh, there are peripheral nerves, nervous uh, neurotechnologies like control labs that are going to probably replace the mouse and certainly be very, very important in virtual reality interface control. And there are uh, a whole bunch of other possible applications. And we're starting to see that now in popular culture and in investment. We, we're, we're seeing investments from big, big tech companies like Facebook, uh, who are spending $250 million on, on brain computer interface research. Uh, Brian Johnson put $100 million into Kernel, and some people got hired at Neurotech SF into Kernel. I think uh, that was, uh, what, what was Stephen. It? Stephen, yeah, Stephen went and then tried to started recruiting in the Neurotech X Slack channel to come to, to Kernel and work on, these, on some of these exciting projects. Um, Neuralink is also, um, so Elon Musk has launched this company that is doing similar kinds of things. Uh, and we're seeing all kinds of really, really interesting things from all over the world in neurotech. It made the cover of The Economist a couple of, uh, a couple of months ago. And it's not something that's in the far future. We're seeing you know, kinds of non-invasive technologies today and even some stimulators that are you know, arguably a little bit invasive. So portable EEG is now ubiquitous, I think. Uh, portable stimulators are quite accessible. Uh, these things are kind of everywhere now, and their, their cost is coming down where a few years ago, these things might have cost $1,000. We're now getting down to the point where they might cost $100 or $200, and that's going to continue to drop for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that technology changes that way. So Douglas Adams, uh, in one of my favorite essays on how to stop worrying and learn to love the internet, is he says technology, you know, Brand Farron says technology is stuff that doesn't work yet. And we used to think of chairs as technology, but we don't think of them as technology anymore because they, they generally work. But at one point, we didn't know how many legs they, would, so they should have and they would crash. Uh, and now they're totally ubiquitous. And computers, and he wrote this in 1996, and he said, computers will be as ubiquitous as chairs. Uh, and now they are. Uh, and you know, eventually, they'll be much, much more ubiquitous than that. And that's probably true of neurotechnology as well. If we can find the right applications for this, uh, the ma manufacturing of this technology at scale means that EEG could be everywhere in 10 or 20 years. It could be used everywhere. FNIRs could be everywhere. Neurostimulators could be, you know, these could be things that you buy at the 7-Eleven or that you just, that cost almost nothing and they're everywhere. Uh, like muses are around our office or hackathons like this. Uh, actually, you're the only, this is the only hackathon that gets to me. <laughs> uh, and, you know, if we take a step back and we look at where did this all come from, uh, While well, the original brain machine interface, the original neurotechnology, arguably, uh, was the EEG. Uh, and this is Hans Berger, this is in Jena in 1924 25, uh, trying to figure out what this thing was, this particular wave that he had seen. So he had this idea that he could measure uh, potentials on the scalp that would reflect underlying brain activity. And sure enough, there were things in there that looked like underlying brain activity that changed with behavior. So this is a sine wave that he ran against this. It was like a 9 or 10 hertz sine wave. And there's this characteristic wave, the Berger wave, which we now call the alpha wave. So over the course of decades, EEG progressed pretty slowly but ubiquitously. It's been around for 90 years. We think we understand it pretty well, but it turns out we don't understand it as well as we thought. Uh, so you know, if you go back to the 30s, it looked like that. In the 80s, um, Dr. Bosniak in the back may remember things looking like this. Uh, the, uh, this was all in the laboratory where I had uh, where I did my PhD in France. So they had this is literally the equipment they've been using all along for EEG and, and the study of epilepsy. Okay, so how do we get to Muse from how do we get to a super low cost system like Muse that actually can do a little bit of EEG from a, from something like that? Well, if we take a step into uh, augmented reality and wearable computing, so some of you may have heard of a guy named Steve Mann. Uh, Steve is considered one of the fathers of wearable computing. Uh, he, was at the, he was at the MIT Media Lab in the 90s. Uh, he's still doing wearable computing at the University of Toronto. He's still sort of a ubiquitous presence in that in the field. Uh, and he has steadily shrunken and innovated on wearable computing. And one of the people who built some of his wearable computing apparatuses, uh, I'll show you this just because it's such an awesome picture. This is the MIT Wearable Computing Club in the 1990s, some mid-90s. Uh, Someday you might hope that, like you, you know, if you take a picture like this at a hackathon, that it gets used as this hilarious thing to show where we were then and where we are now, and how far it's come, and like how you were one of the pioneers. Uh, maybe dress a little better than that for your picture. <laughs> um, so, so this is um, that that cycle of wearable computing led to uh, this is ITAP. This is uh, this is one of the earliest sort of I guess predecessors to Google Glass in terms of augmented reality wearable computing. 
This was a 640 by 480 display. With the, the computer was in a backpack, and this is Chris Amini, who's one of the founders of Interaxon, uh, make news. Uh, what they were trying to do with, uh, with this was figure out ways of controlling the interface, moving a mouse cursor, without uh, an active tactile control, without having to hold a joystick in your hand. And that's what got them into, that's what got the company into using EEG and brain computer interfaces for active control. It did not work out. Uh, but it created some really interesting things. So it tried EEG for augmented reality interface control. It totally didn't work. But it's in the process of doing this, they created these engaging social experiences. This is 20 people hooked up to an EEG system doing EEG sonification. Uh, this is a sort of a symphony at, in, uh, at Louis Blanche in Toronto. Uh, this got uh, pulled all the way into the Vancouver Olympics in 2010, so we had people hooked up to EEG systems in Vancouver in the Ontario Pavilion, uh, driving, using like a straightforward Alpha BCI, driving the lights on the on Niagara Falls, on the Parliament buildings, controlling the lights on the CN Tower, and people really loved that. So that suggested to the founders of Interaxon, where I work, that uh, we were onto something. This is just sort of one example of many examples of neurotech and BCI. Uh, in use today. And so we went from these old versions of EEG to things that now fit into sunglasses. We have a pair right there. There's a cyan has a pair here. Unfortunately, we didn't bring the charger, but it's the same signal, so anything you build on Muse here will work on the glasses as well. So now you can fit a four channel EEG into a pair of sunglasses, and it can do a lot of the things that high density EEG can um, in a sparser way. You can take those experiences that Muse built originally and you can put them into things that this is at the G7 last summer in Quebec City where um, there was some, some drama around international politics, but people were chilling out in the press center. So this allowed us to take these, these, these brain experiences, uh, these brainwave ex experiences or, or uh, I guess what you call uh, interoception and reflection experiences and teach people how to push, the, push a signal around by changing their cognitive state. Uh, and doing this in a social way that was a little more engaging than, than some of the ones that we had done before we used. Uh, this even got to go to, go to Burning Man, and, and I, I should emphasize that most of these experiences have been built with uh, participation from people, from interns and, hack and undergrads at uh, Hackathon Collective and NeurotechX. So these, uh, these experiences are, are uh, really built by like, people like you uh, coming to Hackathons and getting engaged. In, and, uh, and creating exciting, interesting things uh, that, that go out into the world and, and put people in touch with, with brain tech. Uh, this is actually kind of how people get involved. From what we've seen, people try this stuff out and they get really into it, and then they come to a hackathon and this is how the community grows. So this was, a, this was something called the Tree of Tenere on the, on the playa at Burning Man. Uh, it was 25,000 LED leaves driven by 10 EEG systems. Uh, and you could drive it with the accelerometer for respiration, you could drive it with the EEG, uh, and you'd have, each person would have a little part of the tree and then they would come to get together collectively once you threshold it and build your, your BCI classifier on that, on each individual, and create these, these incredible experiences of lighting. Uh, and that, that caused us to start to think about how we do, how we would do uh, investigations of much larger scale data than had ever been done before. If you're picking up 10 people at a time to an EEG system, you need tools that, that, don't, that didn't really exist in the past. So uh, with the support of some of the people in this room uh, who have been involved actively in, in used data analysis for quite some time, we started to build big data pipelines for EEG. Uh, and this is just one example. There are a bunch out there. Flywheel makes some, uh, Ripple makes them. There are, you, you, you could build an EEG cloud as a service or brain data cloud as a service. Um, the one that we built was based on Python toolkit that we started working with hackathons. Uh, so Muse LSL, which was built by Alex Barishon, uh, it became the basis for connecting through web sockets and other things. And, and now we have um, these tools for analyzing very large scale EEG. Now, why would you want to do that? Uh, well, one reason is it turns out you can profile people based not only on EEG, uh, and you build experiences based on, on longitudinally looking at, at the, the profile of the individual, but you can even look at things like the accelerometer data that's in, in Muse, and you can figure out how much people move, and you can make better experiences on that uh, as a result of that. So, you know, this is the RMS score for the accelerometer data. This is an estimate roughly of how much somebody is moving over the course of, say, five minutes of trying to sit still. And people move in very different ways, and they move consistently. So you look at the accelerometer data RMS, and you, prop, you, 
histogram that, and yeah, it looks like some people just fidget a lot more than others. That just tells you some really interesting things about how you have to design BCIs, because some people move a lot at the beginning of sitting down, some people just keep moving, some people settle right down. You can even go deeper into the data, like Hubert from Neurotech Montreal did, uh, and you can pull out interesting insights. So Hubert had this idea, uh, he worked at uh, Interaxon after Neurotech Montreal, and now he's in France doing his PhD in deep learning and EEG. Uh, he had this idea that if he went into the accelerometer data and ran a PCA, that he could pull out heart rate by, based on the movement, the very subtle movement of the head with every heartbeat. And sure enough, there it is, it's called a ballistic cardiogram. So from that, he even went in further and he pulled breath phase. So the heart rate accelerates and decelerates as you breathe. It's called the sinus arrhythmia. And you can even pull breath phase from an accelerometer on the head. This is the, these sensors cost like, these sensors cost like, like the accelerometers now are maybe the, the least expensive sensor in the MUSE system and they're the least expensive sensor in your, your smartwatch. They cost pennies. So from this kind of, from these super low cost sensors, you can derive physiological insights from something that's worn ubiquitously and is everywhere. And you can create all kinds of interesting insights and experiences. You can even build things that have nothing to do with the EEG from something like the glass and the MUSE glasses. So we built uh, uh, one of our summer interns, I think actually, last year built classifiers for posture, for balance, based just on the accelerometers and gyroscopes on the head. These data are accessible in the muses you have in the room, so you can pull these out of the SDK and you can build experiences on these. And then you can use the EEG to tell when you know, somebody is relaxed or focused uh, in the same way as the, as the muse does. This gave us some cool ideas, which is one of, one of the reasons why I think Cyan has a couple of the new muses here, and he's, he's uh, maybe shown them to you. This gave us some ideas about what we could do with uh, and this is, the, the reason I'm showing you this is to illustrate how one idea leads to another, leads to another, leads to a hackathon, leads to another, and then you've got a whole new product and experience. And, and lots of companies, lots of neurotech companies have come along this way, and even uh, people are making money selling apps on, as third-party developers for, for neurotech platforms uh, based on the stuff that they created at hackathons. So there are apps out there, there's one guy who makes something called Muse Monitor who's you know, making a couple thousand dollars a month. Just just on the you know, iOS and Android apps that you built at a hackathon one day. Um, this gave us the idea of integrating other sensors into, uh, into Muse. So we've added a bunch of other uh, cardiac and respiration sensors based on, on photoplethysmographs, SpO2. Uh, you can plug aux channels into the Muse, so you can plug an extra electrode, uh, and there are a couple kicking around the room. You can get heart rate uh, ECG from this, and these are, these are very powerful inputs to uh, physiological experiences and classifiers. Okay, so now another thing you get out of very big EEG data is insights that you might not have otherwise gotten uh, out of EEG period. So if you guys, how many of you guys are neuroscience grad students or students? So you know something about, you know something about, about brain data. And a typical experiment is maybe how many people? 50. 50 is a good number, right? 25 or 25 maybe. And you know, let's say you're looking for differences in age or differences in gender or whatever it is. Uh, you've got 25 and 25 per group. That's that's my, that might even be optimistic sometimes. I was I was more aiming for 15. But. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So if you're yeah, you end up with some challenges in getting in getting insights out of uh, small data sets that are too small. When you have access to data from ubiquitous neurotechnology, you can do things that you couldn't otherwise do before. These are these are Ali's data. Uh, so this is from 6,000 people using Muse in 2015-2016, I think it might have been 2015, in which we pulled out uh, a huge swath of users that represented uh, sort of the whole gamut of ages of, of a user base of people who shared their data voluntarily and we asked them to uh, in the Muse, the Muse user group. And what you see is this really cool phenomenon of now we knew that there was a change in age uh, with certain characteristics of the EEG, but we didn't know whether it was linear or log linear or you know it had some sort of bend to it. It turns out that one of these characteristics, the Berger wave, the first thing that we saw in EEG, uh, is super linearly declining with age, like it's just a straight line. And, and there's a gender difference, and this is also consistent with the literature, in the beta band. Now, we're gonna have to revisit this in a second, but this one is, the literature showed us that in fact, 
You know, there's, there's, there's a difference between males and females, and it turns out that it's quite robust. So if you look at this, this beta band, this beta power difference between males and females is quite robust. Okay, so we thought we knew all kinds of stuff about how the brain worked on the basis of all of the literature that's come along for decades on EEG. What if some of these things were artifacts of the way we measured and analyzed our data? What if we could revisit this in much larger data sets with much more powerful toolboxes? Well, it turns out that when you do this, and these are some of the toolboxes coming from other members of the Neurotech X community and from, uh, from graduate students at UCSD, from Brad Wojtek's lab. So the traditional way of analyzing EEG bands uh, or EEG oscillations, we think we're, we're looking at the burger wave, for example, is you take a bin and you do an FFT on it and you say whatever's inside this and how that changes is the characteristic of that frequency. This is, a, this is the alphabet, say. And that's, if you look at the power spectrum of, of a whole EEG, you do, the, you do your FFT, you look at the power spectrum, and you plot log frequency and log power, you get this nice linear component here, and then you have an oscillation on top. But the way that we categorized this and grouped it was, we just looked at that, and we added everything up as though it all just sort of fit in there. The problem with this, is that the, we're assuming that a change in the, the alpha power, like we saw um, in that population difference, or in the, uh, well, like we see in, in so many things that we assume are, are the case that uh, this oscillation is changing in amplitude, just this oscillation, can be driven by a number of other things. It could be driven by a broadband shift in power, so um, an overall decline in power, which has nothing to do with a change in cognitive state, it's just a, better, a change in signal quality or change in total power it might be driven by a shift in the frequency of the oscillation. And the weirdest one is it can be driven by, could be, we thought, uh, and so did Tom Donahue, uh, could be driven by a shift in the slope of this thing, this characteristic here. So this, is called, this is called the 1 over f characteristic. It used to be called the 1 over f noise because it changed as 1 over f. The slope is characteristic of 1 over f. So there's a new toolbox that Tom developed, and this is just one example of the way that you can do this, in which you know, you'd fit these data, but with a, with a linear fit, uh, you remove that slope, and then you fit the oscillations with a Gaussian. You try, if you can, and you can constrain the number of oscillations you fit, then you refit, and then you refit with Gaussians. So the oscillations are fit as Gaussians, and the one over f is fit as a linear thing. Now what does this do for us? Okay. This is, a, this is, as you can see, and this is actually the kind of thing we see, is a better fit than, better way of fitting than this. Because we're not just looking at a big band of, of oscillations and assuming that the oscillation is, uh, you know, sp spans the entire band of, of the FFT. Well, so we looked, we went back and we looked at 700 people. Uh, we compared this in a sense the same way that, we, that, that Ali had originally done his analysis. And we said, how many alpha peaks are there for, a, for an individual user? So the assumption has always been, hey, everybody has an alpha oscillation. It has a center frequency. They have one peak. They have one oscillation frequency. Well, in fact, most people have one alpha oscillation center frequency. But 15% of them have two. And maybe 20% of them have no discernible alpha oscillation in the, in the, the way that we treat this, these data. And it gets weirder, because remember the 1 over f characteristic? This thing also changes with age. So the slope of the power, there's more high power and less low power in older brains. This is like, this is shifting somehow with age. And so you can take, the hope is that we can, and you know, this might even come out of a hackathon, the hope is that we can do uh, something like what was what was done for uh, in by Eileen Luters and take train a classifier on chronological age brains uh, or of anatomical MRIs and then have it learn to categorize brains by physiological age and get something like a brain age or brain health classifier like the one that was used for the, like the one that was produced for meditators so. Meditation um, this is something that Muse does, teaches meditation. People like to learn to meditate, in part because it's good for mental health, it's good for you know, a number of different things. 
But the crazy part is when you take that classifier, that BrainAge classifier, and it's literally called BrainAge, you can download the software for it. There's even one for EEG. And you look at the chronological age of control subjects, the chronological age and the estimated brain age, estimated age from, is, is a linear fit, as you'd expect. But then you take a group of meditators and something happens. So the chronological age increases, but the estimated age of their brains increases more slowly. So let's detrend that. And it looks like the older so controls, you know, they, they, they age, and we, teach, we take out this, this linear trend. With meditators, the older they get, the younger their brains look relative to their chronological age. So by the time somebody gets to 50 years old, if they've been meditating for five years, their brains look anatomically seven and a half years younger than non-meditators. This is neurotechnology can allow us to discover this kind of stuff, and it can potentially even allow us to help people achieve this kind of thing with neurofeedback-assisted learning or uh, a BCI that helps people train their brains to for this, that, or the other kind of application or task. Uh, even cognitive gaming, potentially. Here's another super exciting uh, finding, I think, out of the, the Wojtek lab. So another thing we think about when we think about um, EEG, when we build BCIs, is we assume normality in a lot of statistics. So we assume that, you know, there's, um, there's an assumption that, that oscillations vary kind of around a center of set point in a way that you can represent with a normal distribution. But these distributions, it turns out, are super highly skewed. They're not normal distributions. They're outlier driven. Now, what happens if you do 100 trial alpha or 100 trials of um, looking at an alpha burst. This, is, this even applies to things like evoke potentials. Uh, and, you, and you simulate a single outlier burst. It turns out that that actually, that single outlier burst can produce a statistically significant difference in between conditions, in between groups. That's a big problem because the statistics that have been used for EEG for a long time have assumed normality because they've, they've used Welch's test. They've assumed heteroscedasticity. None of, none of these things, it's, it seems, are true anymore. Now, you could look at this and say this is a big, big problem for, for neuroscience, but this is actually maybe one of the most exciting things to come along. We, through the development and ubiquity of low-cost neurotechnology and BCIs, can now see things that and challenge assumptions and make things more effective than they were before. We can get closer to the truth of how the brain works, and we can build more effective technologies. So, you know, one of the you'll see uh, you, how many of you have heard of neurofeedback. Right, so a lot of you have heard of neurofeedback. If you go and you look at the literature on neurofeedback, uh, one of the things that comes up is that for every positive result, encouraging result, there's a null result. And there's, you know, there've been a challenge. There've been challenges about this for decades, but it could just be that you know we've been treating it, we've, we've been building the whole thing on on z distributions. We've been building the whole thing on assumptions of normality, where we could be modeling oscillations and making this thing, making neurofeedback. You know, much, much more effective. We could build an effective tool for intervention in mental health. And we wouldn't, had we not gone in and like challenged these assumptions, had not had, you know, argued, I think people who were much younger than the establishment in EEG, uh, people who go to hackathons, people who dig into the data and like come up with creative solutions, had they not gone in and looked, we, would, we might never have gotten to this point where we could start to finally build more effective tools. How are we over time? Okay, here's another cool thing that you can do with neurotech. So, some of you, you know, you'll be playing around with EEG uh, and you'll be looking at continuous EEG, but if we show you a stimulus or play you a sound, and we synchronize uh, triggers to the, to the onset of that stimulus, not only can we know exactly where in the brain certain signals are coming from because of all of the, the hard work that's been done by, uh, by neuroscientists over years, but we can even see, so this is, a, this is a characteristic, at the onset of that, that stimulus, if we signal average and we filter, we get something called an evoked potential. Now, evoked potentials are interesting to researchers because they tell us things about brain plasticity and about brain function. And we know exactly where in the brain many of these things come from because uh, we've characterized it so well through research. But what gets cool is that if you can do this on a regular basis for an individual, you can start to tell differences, day-to-day -day differences in cognitive function and cognitive state. So you can build a classifier that says, hey, this person's rested and this person, you know, or this is a football player. 
normally, and this is at them after they hit their hit. So they can't return to play until their ERP is back there, their vote potential is back there, or their fatigue. This is a truck driver or a, or a mining operator or an oil rig operator, and they come to work, and this is their P3 potential. These guys should not go on shift because they're too fatigued. They're not. They're not functioning. This is a. This is actually already out there. So you can go and download this, and I think you have. Uh, Cyan may have may have this app installed on one of the, the iPads that we brought down. So you can go and test out this app that does evoke potentials and repeats them every single day, and you can get a ca characteristic evoke potential for an individual on iOS with a portable EEG device. This creates real opportunities to think about where we go next now that we can build these things super low cost, and we can get evoke potentials and we can characterize them for an individual. So you can. Um, this was some of the work that we did last summer. Uh, this is Nicole, who uh, is also a Neurotech X member. Uh, we 3D printed some electrodes and stuck them into VR systems. So the idea is, you can get VR that works in in Neurotech, uh, or works with Neurotech now, uh, but it costs ten thousand dollars to get a system, or fifty thousand dollars to get a system if you're buying it from from Brain Products. What if we could make this thing cost like five hundred bucks? And so that's the question and one of the challenges that we're we're facing right now. And there are, so there, are, there are lots of interesting challenges in building that. One of them is, you know, you have to figure out a way to manufacture, you have to figure out a way to get through the hair, you have to figure out a way to get good electrode contacts that are stable and comfortable. And then you also have to build the connectors for Unity and for Unreal. Uh, and all of these things require the community's input and testing. So when these things come along, when we finally get these things to go. Ah. <laughs> yeah. You're out of time. <laughs> I'm out of time. You can potentially take things like, and this is this is from uh, this is Ben Shapiro's work. Okay, so let's say we show you two different diffraction gradients, high contrast, and we signal average them. Uh, individual trials we look at, and we see these characteristics, and this is the difference between this is you know looking at uh, looking at this one, and this is looking at that one for a single individual. These are the differences in the brain responses, uh, measured in views with, uh, with the ox electrode. Within 20 trials, you can get perfect classification. You can tell from the ERP, the EEG, what someone has seen. So for those of you who are looking, who are uh, interested in, in cognitive uh, neuroadaptive gaming, I would recommend, I suggest, in fact, that you take a step back from the, the active PCI stuff and go and look at Torsten Zander's work on neuroadaptive technology. Uh, from the Technical University of Berlin, in which he talks about how you would take this tech, th these kinds of things, you'd be able to measure these things in real time and make a neuroadaptive game so that you could tell not only what somebody had seen, uh, but you could adapt the game on the basis of whether or not they recognized the stimulus or whether they were engaged or disengaged. Like, tremendously exciting potential for this kind of technology at low cost and ubiquitous. You can take an EEG and you can put it in a car and you can drive around and you can measure relaxation and stress index. So IBM did this with a bunch of users. This is the IBM uh, ECI research team. Uh, and they're driving along and they're driving along and then something, you know, they're merging onto a highway and the, the cognitive state of the, the driver changes as they measure it. You can do things like what MIT did. Uh, so what the Media Lab did at MIT where they subjected, as you can do, as some of you who you know, maybe neuroscientists or psychology students have done, you could subject students to pain, it turns out. You have, them, you have them hold their hand in an ice bath until they can no longer hold their hand in an ice bath. Uh, and you build a classifier. You don't even have to assume that this is EEG. This might be EMG. This might be, you know, it's, it's not necessarily noise, but they just did, they said, okay, here's within this alpha frequency range, and they did a naive classifier on the basis of these data. And you get a pretty good classifier for acute pain. Uh, so you can tell whether or not someone is feeling pain based just on the signals you're pulling off neurotechnology devices. So, why is this all exciting? Why are you guys all here? I think that the reason why so many people are into neurotech now is, you know, there are many of them, but um, it's that finally this stuff is accessible and, and really usable outside of the laboratory. And that presents some very exciting opportunities. When I talk to uh, when I learned EEG, it was from uh, this guy back here in the, in the grove, looking at his phone, not paying attention to the top. Uh, <laughs> when, when, I learned, when I learned about EEG, when I first started in grad school, um, there were no private sector jobs in neurotechnology. 
Uh, there was really only deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease. That was the one application you could get. Uh, and now there are uh, all kinds of companies doing all kinds of interesting work. There are uh, uh, control labs. There's a whole list of them. Uh, I'll, go, I'll go into that in a second. But the most exciting part of it is that because you're young and you've got and you're into this and you've got the opportunity to, to really create something and there's something already underway, um, you can hopefully have a career in neurotechnology. So as Douglas Adams says, you know, anything that's in the world already when you're born is normal. Anything that gets invented between then and the time you turn 30 is incredibly exciting and with any luck you can make a career out of it. That's where you guys are. Like this industry is gonna happen and you can have a career in this in the private sector. You don't have to be in university. Uh, and then, you know, anything that gets invented after your 30 is against the natural order of things and beginning of the end of the world as we know it until it's been around for 10 years when it finally turns to be all right. And you're, you're ideally positioned not only because you're young and into neurotech, but because you come from Canada. Canada can and probably will lead in the neurotechnology industry. Uh, and this goes, there's a reason for this that goes all the way back to Wilder Penfield. So because we had an early start in neurotech, and because we had Donald Head and Brendan Miller and David Hubel and Don Stoss and Terry Picton and Jeff Hinton, all these very, very famous neuroscientists who became pioneers and trained grad students and populated the universities, we are one of the strongest, I think, spots in the world for neuroscience. Well, certainly we are this, one of the strongest spots in the world for neuroscience research. And we are currently, thanks to the hard work of people like Yannick and, and Cyan and um, Oishi and Hector, one of the strongest places in the world for neurotechnology skills. Uh, neurotechnology skills development, people who know how to do stuff. Uh, that's going to be a critical determining factor in the future of the neurotech industry. So let's say you decide you want to go into the neurotech industry. If you want to work in neurotech, you want to find a career in this, there are, there are ways you can do this. And there are places you can work. There are established clinical companies like cochlear implant manufacturers that make neurotechnology. Uh, they're all over the world in different countries. There are neurostim companies like Medtronic and others. Uh, there are lots of imaging and diagnostics companies. So there are EEG, MRI, FNIRS companies that hire neurotechnology skill. They hire engineers and neuroscientists to work on neurotech. Uh, there are new and exciting companies that are working not just in, in, uh, in research tools, but in therapeutics. So Occam's Razor, Cognito. Uh, there are companies that are doing primarily cognitive science, but with a neurotechnology and a neuroscience bent, like Achille Interactive making video games for prescribable, reimbursable video games for ADHD. Uh, this, is, this is pretty cool stuff. If you're in a game design, like, you can have a job in what's going to replace the pharma industry for behavior modification, uh, which is crazy. Like Achille Interactive, they're, they're hiring like crazy. Pair Therapeutics are hiring like crazy. This is, this is game design for therapeutic interventions, and it's, like, it's unbelievably exciting. There are consumer and non-invasive companies like OpenBCI, Melomind, Think, Halo, Mindset, uh, and software and experience companies like Neurable and Peer and MindLift and Omind. So you don't even have to be in the hardware side. You can stay in the software side and you can work in neurotech. You can even do this just in Canada. So you could get a job with any of the companies that, that hire neuroscientists like Synaptive Medical, Perimeter, Canavi. Huron Technologies up in Waterloo just moved into a new building, hired 100 people. They do you know, patholo uh, imaging, pathology, and technology development, hardware development, software development, AI. Uh, you can go and work for companies like, like Interaxon or Virtus or, or Mindset, uh, or mental health companies like Winterlight or Pocket Health or CloudDX. So CloudDX builds uh, hardware for me the measurement of physiology. Very similar challenges to what you guys are, are working on here today. If you want to move into this, how do you do it? Well, you can hack your way to business knowledge. We, this is what we do. We hack things to, to, to make, make our way into um, new technologies and opportunities. So probably not a lot. We're, we're mostly engineers and scientists here, I assume. I think that's a safe assumption. Probably not a lot of us get business knowledge background, but you can, you can figure it out relatively easily uh, just by going to, like, sitting in on, sneaking into business classes, uh, and you can, this, this will really, really help if you start your own technology company or if you go to work for one. Uh, how to manage people, how to manage your time, how to organize projects. Um, you can learn business shorthand. There are more and more mentors out there in the neurotech community who will help you. Um, and you can get books like the ones that I recommended, the Personal MBA, High Output Management, The Effective Manager, The Effective Manager. Um, if you want, if you're 
if you're really, really skilled in data science, you can go into data science and, and ML. Um, AI is, uh, overlaps quite closely with neurotechnology and neuroscience. This is especially true in Montreal, where you have you know, Montreal AI and neuroscience. Uh, the huge organization that ties together all of these things brings neuroscientists into AI and AI into neuroscience. And the tools that you need to get started are not inaccessible. They're the kinds of things that probably many of you are using here just to be a data scientist or a, or a machine learning specialist in neurotech. There are even fellowships for people who've recently graduated from PhDs, like the, uh, like the Insight Data Science Fellowships. And you can have a career trajectory in the private sector that looks very different from what, it, what used to be the limiting factors for us as neuroscientists in academia. So if you were a neuroscientist when, uh, when Dan and I were, were coming through grad school, which is not that long ago, uh, your options were, well, you can, go to the, you can go to academia or you can go into like a research hospital, but now you can go into the, the private sector and you can have a totally different career trajectory. So because it's not academia, um, you don't have to pay your dues in the same way. You can have, things can go very, very fast for you. Um, you can change companies, and you will change companies if you work in the tech sector. In, the, uh, in Silicon Valley, Boston, New York, Toronto, the average tech worker stays in a company for two years, and the average executive stays there for four and a half years. Now, that's the, that's the duration. That doesn't mean that they're getting fired. It means that they're moving on to better jobs for more money, uh, or they're going off to start their own companies. And if you're a specialist, if you're a highly skilled engineer, you can make yourself indispensable to a company, you can, you can really do well, you can have your own little niche, or you can move in, into management, uh, and you can become uh, an organizational leader where your skills atrophy a little bit, but you still get to stay involved. This is what happened to me. I rely on, uh, I rely on Cyan and, uh, and Oishi and other team members to, to be able to code things up for me because I suck at coding compared to them now. Uh, but you know, being able to, to figure out how to organize and prioritize projects is, is, a, is a valuable skill that then generalizes beyond just your sector. Finally, so you get to do really cool things in the neurotech sector. So uh, more and more, I think, we're seeing real opportunities to go and do, to, to access incredible career paths and opportunities to, uh, to work on really interesting problems. Work on really interesting problems. This is Olaf Grigolson, who's published a couple of papers uh, with us. Uh, they got noticed by NASA, and they asked us to come down to uh, NASA Langley and go in their simulators and, and help them learn how to use EEG in, in space research and, and commercial aviation research. And they put us in a simulator with the glasses and the views on, uh, and they said, fly around, we're going to measure your brain waves. So these kinds of opportunities are available out there for people working in with skills in neurotech, and I hope that you guys will uh, take advantage of the skills you're developing here to explore new career avenues and new opportunities. And uh, we will help, NeurotechX will help, Interaxon will help to the fullest extent that we can. So don't hesitate to get in touch with me or with Yannick or with Hector uh, or with anyone if you have questions. Thanks for having me down here. It's been a real pleasure.